I think as we talked about way back in the beginning, that um, if you look at the, well, especially the new, the DSM-5, there's this big <coughs> box, and, and it's pervasive developmental disorders. Now, what does that mean? It sounds kind of scary, right? But if you look at the, the various criteria for these pervasive development disorders, what you see is you could call them abilities or lack of lacks of abilities, lack of abilities, um, or areas of behavior and or learning that fall outside of you know this standard you know whatever it is one or two standard deviations so if a child spends you know x amount of time and there's there's like you know a dozen of these right so if a child spends x amount of time angry then he that that he, that gets a checkbox, you know? If he spends X amount of time exhibiting some symptom of stress or, or impulse control or, or any one of a dozen things, you know, that we've, we've looked at, those, those, they get checkboxes. They get checkboxes. Um, and, again, unlike, um, let's say, strep throat, that has this simple, it's a yes or no test. It's like, you know, it's like the pregnant little little pink strip, right? You, you know, you pee on it and it comes up, you know, pink or blue or plus or minus. That's it. There really is no in between, right? Well, but, but all these are subjective. And so, so what they have is this big box, this big box here, called pervasive development disorders. Pervasive meaning it's not just one thing. It's like spread out. It's a little <clears throat> memory, it's impulse control, it's stress, it's uh, active, hyperactivity, it's um, failure to recognize social cues, um, and so there's all these little things. They're all spread out all over the place. Does that make sense? So when we're talking to parents, you know, what does this mean? It just sounds so scary, but it just means it's not, it's not, it's not localized. It's not just like, you know, oh, you know, somebody got run over by a bus and lost his arm. Okay, his arm's gone. You know, that's a disability and, and you know, God help him and bless him and, and we can see it. It's clear. It's, you know, I was going to say clear cut, <laughs> right? But it's, it's, that's it. It's, it's, it's there. It's identifiable. But, but with these guys... It's like it's a little bit of this. This isn't quite right, or this isn't quite right, or this isn't quite right. But these three things are okay. In fact, you know, his visual and spatial acuity is above average. His intelligence is above average. His his puzzle solving skills are above above average. His pattern recognition skills are above average. <laughs> now you don't see that in here. They don't talk about that in here. They just say, well, he can't do this, and he can't do that, and he can't do this, and he's, and he's doing this too much, and this too much. So there's, you know, the focus is all on what these guys can't do or shouldn't do, um, when, when what we can do for parents and the kids is start bringing this conversation, yeah, he struggles with reading, but, but look at his ability to recognize patterns and and maybe maybe musical or artistic or or maybe he's just going to be an awesome freaking linebacker 
you know, or a skateboarder, or snowboarder, or whatever else he, he decides to do. Um, but anyway, so um, the nice thing I like about the second word, so the first, so we have, so let, let, me, let me just write these down. So we have pervasive, which simply means scattered, right? It's a little bit here and a little bit there. It's, it's not, it shouldn't be a scary word for parents. Developmental. See, now this is cool. Developmental. What does that mean? It means it has something to do with development. It's something that gets developed. Again, it's not like the arm that's either missing or there, right? And and if someone did was unfortunate enough to lose an arm in a in a you know Republican hunting accident or or something whatever I don't know or a bus, um, the arm doesn't grow back. It doesn't it doesn't disappear when, at at eight thirty when he goes to school, but then when he comes home and sits in front of the TV or a video game, or or skateboards, it magically reappears, right? So that's not a developmental issue. That's a that's a like a, a loss. That's like it's gone. It's you know, it's cut off, cut out, it's gone, missing. But a developmental issue is something that the equipment is basically there. Does that make sense? So the brain is there, the equipment is there, but it's it's not it's like we haven't learned how to use it. He hasn't been taught how to turn off that stress response. He hasn't learned how to stop flipping his letters. So, so to me, this, is, this should not be scary for parents, and this should be almost encouraging. Because it's saying the equipment's there, we just... For some reason, he hasn't developed the skill, the strategy to, to accomplish those particular tasks or behaviors. And then disorder, well, that just means you're outside of the norm. But so is, you know, Einstein. Edison, um, Disney, you know, on and on and on and on. Of course, Leonardo da Vinci, he was about as right brain as you could possibly, you know. I mean, he was way out there. Created his own backwards, you know. Um, I, know I know he had a different model, but um, I, have a, I have a simpler model. Um, So uh, when I write from right to left in my secret code, <laughs> that's actually what that means. Um, and I did at one point. I just got so tired of fighting books that were all written the wrong way and notebooks that went from, you know, you know, they went from front to back. I said, I'm just going to write from from right to left from now on. That's it. And, and I, so I created this little, uh, actually I, I, I stole the, the base, the foundation from um, the Greg or Craig, Greg, Greg shorthand, like what secretaries used to learn. Mm -hmm. And I just found an old book in the Goodwill store and, or garage sale or something, and I transposed the whole book like backwards. So I, would, I literally, I went through all the pages and all those crazy little symbols, I would, you know, they were like, you know, this, this, 
and this, or you know this, or whatever, and I would transpose them back. So I was writing them all backwards. And with a little bit of practice, I got the hang of it. And it's all phonetic, so it's you know it's pretty, pretty, pretty easy to master with a little practice. Um, and when I knew a gal that could actually read short the great shorthand, um, I could take my book, hold it up to a mirror, and and she could like read most of it. It was pretty cool. Anyway. Yeah, Da Vinci did the same. He he created a whole system of writing that went from right to left, so that he, writing with his left hand, he didn't smear the work because that was with fountain pens and ink pens. Right, that was one of the big problems that you would smear your work with your hand. Anyway, so how are we doing? We getting settled back there? Yeah. All right. All right. Um, so what, one of the things we're talking about right now is just this this over. Um, this broad term, this generalized term that gets used to encompass some of the issues that we're talking about, ADHD, sensory integration disorder, auditory processing disorder, Asperger's syndrome, autism, um, and a couple other things that they all come under this umbrella of pervasive development disorders. So we're just explaining that, you know, the word pervasive, it sounds scary, but really what it means is like disjointed, like a little bit here and a little bit here and a little bit over here and a little bit over here rather than one big thing. And that developmental actually really means the, the equipment is there, but the child has not developed the skill to use it. That's my interpretation. And of course disorder just means they don't fit into this little bell curve norm. Yeah, did they have something like um, autism or just dyslexia? Does it mean that they kind of like have a touch of all the other disorders that kind of, or are they can they be completely well, separate things? Well, see, that's that's a weird way of saying it. It's not that they have a touch of the other disorders. It's that all those disorders sort of overlap. Does that make sense? Yeah. They they overlap. So, you know, if I was to try to do some graphing, you know, like, you know, in inside of this pervasive developmental disorder, all these possibilities. So dys dyslexia. Oh, the little guy's got the keys again. Hi. Oh, surprise. Surprise. Yeah, I did that. So, you know, dyslexia shows up as, you know, flipping uh, their letters and numbers, maybe not processing auditory information quite as well. Um, it may have some handwriting difficulties. <laughs> it may have some handwriting struggles. Um, it may have um, some problems with memorization, right? Mm -hmm. um, again, converting those those auditory uh, the auditory information into something that's meaningful. Um, whereas now, uh, classic um, ADHD will probably have some often has some struggle reading and processing phonics, um, but it also may have hyperactivity, it may have some memory issues, okay, but it also has a lot higher stress response than, than that dyslex you don't see in dyslexia, okay? And then autism or, or Asperger's or something, um, oh, and, and it may have a little bit of sensitivity to touch, and a little bit of struggle processing um, abstract information, okay? Now let's look at autism. Um, flipping the letters and numbers and struggle with reading, the memorization, um, not necessarily the hyperactivity, but, but definitely some problems with memory, um, processing auditory information, um, way sensitive to touch, Okay, 
um, more processing social cues, um, and um, a, a way, usually a more significant problem with judgment and, and reasoning, although you may see a little bit of that with, with ADD, and you may see a tiny bit of it with dyslexia. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, depending upon the value, you know, if this is ranked four instead of two, and this is two instead of four, and then this is and this is three instead of six, on you know, on all these score sheets, right? When you put it all together, it will come out in one of those one of those boxes, you know. Your, if you have these, your, your, what was that one again? Oh, that was autism. And if you, if you're all the blues, you have ADD or ADHD. And if you have enough reds, then, then you're dys dyslexic. Does that make sense? Yep. And, and I would, um, even if you're not going to buy it, just find, a, find a, the DSM-5, not this one. Um, but the DSM-5, although, you know, it, it wouldn't be bad just to look at the old one to compare it and see what they've done. Because the other thing they've done is they've taken some, um, the higher... The ADDs that have a little too much impulse control, and now they're starting to an emotion. Oh, um, too much emotion and what? It used to call it ADHD with like depression or impulsivity or something like that. Now, now, um, now they're calling it. Let's see if you got this and 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 this over here. Now it's Boy, and if you ever had any argument about getting on meds with ADD, try to keep your kid off of meds if he's diagnosed bipolar. Yeah, they'll, they'll, they're going to be with the county. You, you'll be sitting there alone at night wondering who's got your kids. That's just my opinion. Okay? So, bipolar what, is, what, what's, what's... Is when you're really happy and then you're really sad and then you're really... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, let me see. Let me see. Let me see. Here's my right brain. Here's my left brain. <laughs> and they're not talking to each other. Hmm. Maybe some highs and lows out of that? You think? Yeah. But but this is a little bit scary for me. This is this, I see this a little bit scary because because um, there's more and more of this happening where parents are refusing certain types of medical treatment and they just come in and take your kids away. It's considered child abuse. Um, and they become wards of the state. So, um, you know, with ADHD or dyslexia, a high functioning autism, you can probably get away with not medicating your kids. If they're diagnosed bipolar, you have and, and the school much? nurse or someone else says, you know, they come back with the testing and, and it says, your kid's bipolar or something, boy. I you got mail. Fight on your I think you got to fight. You're you're in a real dangerous situation. So, you know. Anyway, I don't want to get into too much politics, and you know, certainly don't want to debate with the drug companies because you know they could squash me like a bug. So, um, I stay out of that controversy. I saw a bumper sticker that said, "Save a child, shoot a drug dealer." <laughs> 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 That's a good one. Okay. So, so again, you know, I always want to generally present parents with the best news possible, with the not a airy fairy story. I don't want to lie to them. I don't want to pump smoke up their, you know, skirt. But 
I want to counteract some of the real negative doom and gloom out there um, that can be pretty scary. You know, I mean, when, when you take your child in or the school takes them in and they come back with a diagnosis of, well, he's got ADHD and depression and bipolar and, and you know, and, and sensory integration issues and, and um, some kind of auditory processing issue which we can't figure out. It's like, wow! How scary. Moms that, don't really understand a lot of it either. They're just like, ooh, they're all labeled with this, what do I do? I found a lot of people come up to me and they're just saying their child's in this, 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 and they don't really understand the whole thing. Yeah. Well, <coughs> I think the important thing to remember is pretty much all of those things, with very few exceptions, the ODD, the OCD, the bipolar now, and all this, it all comes under this group. It all comes under the pervasive, meaning more than one place, more than one area of, of, of skills, more than one skill set, more than one behavior. It's developmental, which means um, we can't actually find anything wrong with them. Okay? That's what that means. It means their brain is there, all the muscles are there, right? All the parts are there and apparently working, they're just not being used. They, they, the child has not developed the skills or the strategies to use that left and right brain together, to process information across the hemispheres, to, to you, to use their fine motor skills. Does that make sense? In some cases, we see that if you wait a year or two, the problem actually goes away. This is really c common with speech problems. And I don't mean, I don't mean, you know, muscular, neuro, neuromuscular problems or anything like that. Or, or brain development, uh, I mean, like, like literally brain development problems. Um, what I mean is, children that just have delayed speech. If you wait a year, they start talking. If you take them to a speech and language pathologist, they start talking in a year. If you don't take them to a speech and language pathologist, they start talking in a year. <laughs> Again, I'm not trying to interfere with anyone's uh, uh, medical practice or medical treatment. What I'm saying is, it seems that there are children out there that are simply, you know, they're behind the curve. Um, there's been a, num a lot of research that says if we stop sorting children by age, this bell curve here, which is like, you know, this huge difference in ability, okay, it actually becomes something like about a 3% variance in intelligence for plus or minus two standard deviations. It's minimal. Now, that also doesn't account for learning, learning style. But, but basic intelligence, if we stop sorting kids by age, the, the biggest part of that bell curve just disappears. So, anyway. Um, so, let's look at our, our pervasive development disorder overview. Um, we've got our 24 skills, 24 essential skills. Yes? Yeah, I was just wanting to say that's what they did to my son Aaron because he was okay. He just couldn't do it the way they wanted it, so they put him in other RS, RS, RS. Mm hmm. Re yeah. yeah. And the problem was other. Uh, other. Other. Yeah. Yeah. Well, oh, there's, oh, I forgot about the fa my favorite one. My favorite one. If you don't fit into, into any of these boxes, they have another one. They have pervasive developmental disorder, not otherwise. Not specified? Is that the word? Specified. Yeah. PDD NOS. PDD NOS. Yes. So if you don't fit in into the in, in, in any of the other boxes, but you're still in. This overview box, this over box, the, the pervasive development box, then it's pervasive developmental disorder not otherwise specified. 
So, d does does that does that making sense? I know I, it's, it feels hard to explain that in some ways these categories are kind of random. They're arbitrary. They're just they they've picked a set of symptoms, and and they've classified that as ADD. But if on a given day you don't quite fit, you may get an entirely different diagnosis. And this is something else that parents find frustrating, is they take their child in and they get one diagnosis. They take them to another doctor, they get a completely different diagnosis. Like either the same month or the same year, maybe a year later. What's that about? So again, if we can, if we can assure them and explain to them how you know, you've got these different categories, these different symptoms, and just it depends on a given day which ones that the doctor or psychologist or psychiatrist happens to see, and how the teacher fills out his report, and how the mother fills it. You know, you could have a particularly boring teacher, and she's gonna, you know, she's gonna have your son all over the place, you know, because he's gonna be bored to tears in that classroom. <laughs> He gets a good teacher who's engaging, a little more visual and, and, and some, some subject matter that, that's appealing to him, and all of a sudden, he's now he's off the spectrum. <laughs> By the way, Lisa's showing up in a little bit. She just I let her sleep late today. <laughs> she was beat. Um, so, so that's where we're starting out. Um, for the most part, these are the skills that will come into play most often. Most often. There's some others, a few other ones, but these are the ones um, uh, that come into play most often. All right. So let's look at the overview. We have ADD, ADHD. We have sensory integration disorder. Auditory. Oh, and they changed the name of that to something else now. Sensory something processing um, auditory pro I think it's sensory processing disorder they, they didn't like those two not matching up or something um, auditory processing Asperger syndrome autism PDD NOS nonverbal learning disorder obsessive compulsive oppositional defiant disorder dyslexia dysgraphia dyscalculus stuttering Tourette's and academic struggles without diagnosis and they're in like I said I haven't really spent a lot of time with the DSM-5, um, there may be half a dozen other new things that they've, they've added, okay? Um, oh, like bipolar. So bipolar is down there too. Um, so in general, when, you're, when, you're, when you have something that, that, that pervade PDD type thing, what are the typical symptoms and challenges where you will be somewhere on the scale you know somewhere on the scale you might have it fifty percent ninety percent ten percent whatever it is but you're gonna be somewhere on on those you're gonna be probably somewhere either off the chart or kind of like at the edge of the chart or something um, stress um, stress anxiety uh, and, and a call kind of frustration and maybe bordering on anger, um, depending on how far down you are. Focus and attention. In the context of something like the classroom, I don't think I've ever met an ADD kid who couldn't focus on a video game. That couldn't, you know, if he wanted to, go skiing. Or snowboarding or skateboarding, okay? What? You, anybody ski, snowboard, skateboard? Okay. What's the level of focus and attention you need to go skiing down a black diamond? Incredible. Yeah. Yeah. My son, he he was skiing for a week, and he start he was going down black diamond backwards. Okay. He's like he's like going backwards. Come on, helping his little friend, you know, and he's like. Shh, shh, shh. And then he turns around and he goes back the other way. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think I've told you, some of you about, he, he we, we went uh, down to the shore. We went, we just kind of took a father-son trip down to, I guess it was uh, Santa Cruz, 
um, uh, the the what's the, where's the Mo Monterey the aquarium, and we got as far as Pismo Beach, and we were truck tooling around on the beach and around town. We saw this little surf shop, and it's like, wow, I've never been surfing before. That sounds cool because he likes skateboarding and whatnot. So I said, we're here. You want to go? He's like, yeah. So we signed up for a lesson. Um, Hung out that night, that evening, afternoon, whatever. Next morning, we go down. He gets his wetsuit. The guy gives him a big old board. Um, nothing like the little competition boards. You know, it's a pretty, pretty good size one. And, uh, and I walk down to the beach with him. And uh, he takes him out. Lesson's supposed to be about an hour or two. I forget what. And, uh, and I went to the car to go get the camera. I thought, oh, this would be cool. You know, get a shot of him. Maybe, you know, who knows? Maybe for a second. You know, maybe he can get up on the board or something like that. Um, and I come back, I look, and here he is. <laughs> He's riding in on the wave. I'm like, no way. No way. And, and he just like it, was like, it was like he'd been doing his whole life. And he'd swim out and, and you know, feel the wave as it was, you know, getting, getting up there. He'd start swimming and, and then hop up on his knees and hop up. Up, up on the board and -da -da -da, you know like some Beach Boy movie you know <laughs> right and I'm like holy moly and and um, so so later on that afternoon the instructor's gone but he still had the board and everything for the day I thought well gosh it can't be that hard you know so he's like I say okay so what did you do and he said well I just you know you just paddle out and you get ahead of the wave and then you and then you hop up and and that's it you know I'm like Okay, cool. You know, I ride a bike and everything. I, 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 I have pretty good balance, you know? And uh, so I like, I like get, and I see the wave coming, and I like paddle, 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 and I start to get up on my knees, and then, boosh, I'm upside down. I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm like, I mean, we got the same genes here, man. This can't, it can't be that hard. And I get out again, and I paddle, 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 get up on my knees and I'm just about to lift up my hand and then boom I'm upside down <laughs> underwater again. Oh okay maybe it's a little harder than I thought but uh, anyway so yeah so these natural abilities that 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 we have um, okay challenge though challenges back to challenges so stress focus tension organization you know, that left brain, right brain, you got to have that left brain. If you want to organize your thoughts and information, you got to get that into the picture. You need a strategy. You have to develop a strategy for, for using that left and right brain together to process information. So if a left, per, left brain person does something like surfing, does that mean that they're they don't. right? They don't. They don't. They don't. Show me an accountant who surfs. I mean, maybe there is one. I don't know, but 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 you don't see it. I'm not saying that every ADHD child surfs or snowboards or or skateboards, but I would bet that pretty much every person who snowboards, skateboards, or surfs is pretty much ADD. Pretty much. That would be my assertion. I would defy you to find me some uh, a surfer who's not s leaning that way, whether they were diagnosed or not. That's my assertion. Okay. Well, I used to ski before I got married. Uh, my husband won't go skiing because he says, you know, what if I hurt myself and then I can't work? You know, it's not worth it. Mm -hmm. So he doesn't want to try. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's like football players, you know? Show me a football player who's not ADD or, or very, very high visual. I don't, mean they're, I don't mean they're diagnosable at ADD, but they're very, very visual, very, very intense, very, very competitive, and, and, and they're seeing things all going on at once. Myth. Can you learn to do that? Maybe, I guess with enough practice and motivation, but... I, I don't know. I mean, there's probably exceptions to every rule. So, you know, whenever you make a generalization, you're wrong. Think about that one. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, so, um, okay, so, so we, we have these big three. I mean, they're, they're at the top of every program. That's the first thing I look at. Stress reduction, focus and attention, and organization. Now we get into some basic, you know, academic skills. Spelling and vocabulary. Um, could be anything related to processing symbolic or information. <coughs> could be alphabetical, numerical, symbolic, although some, a lot of uh, high visuals are going to be awesome at math, you know? Um, that, that's a wild card. Um, reading, comprehension and retention, uh, memorization, note-taking can be a struggle because if I start writing, I can't listen anymore. Um, without without a strategy for that, can it be learned? Yes. Are you gonna learn that? I did. Sh I showed you how to do that, didn't I? I must have missed it. Okay, the little the little tracing thing, this this thing here, mm -hmm. for helping kids with their with their handwriting, by tracing it three times with your eyes open and three times with your eyes closed, and then practicing writing things without looking at your paper. Okay. Um, what happens is very quickly you start writing words instead of letters. Well, one of the problems I have is when I'm trying to take notes when you're listening, mm -hmm. I'll forget how to spell the word. So i got to stop listening and try to remember how to spell the words. Right, but what's the point of, what, what is the point of your notes? To remember. But right, it, but so, 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 so what I that. say is get over all that. If you're going to take notes just to remember, first of all, you have to get the information, which means you can't be spending half your time writing things down. Right? You better be spending 90% of your time listening to the information so that you can at least hear it. Let's say that gives you 10% of the time to actually write. Well, if you write about half as fast as the speaker speaking, that means you can actually write 5% of what they say without missing anything. Does that make sense? That's not very productive. I mean, that's not... It's not a lot. It's not enough. So, no, no. No? <laughs> no. If, if you're trying to write down all the information, yes, it's not enough. But if... You use the keyword strategy, right? Here's the title of my lecture. And all I'm going to do is, now remember, we're training ourselves to listen visually. We want to visualize whatever this person's saying. So we're in the conversation. We're not drifting off, going to the Bahamas, you know, thinking about margaritas. Right? We're, we're in the conversation with dynamic visual listening, whether it's a speaker speaking or we're, whether we're reading. So we're making pictures out of what they say. Now, what do I want to do? I want to write down the, the important keywords, or let's call them trigger words. to trigger my picture. Okay. Now I've been doing this for, for a fair amount of time and in eight pages, ten pages, you get about one keyword per page. In a real meaty lecture, you tend to get about ten keywords, ten or twelve keywords for every 45 minutes. That's about it. If it's more than that, if there's more than 10 key points, and, and some of these might have a little, some sub points, but they're going to be really in the same picture, right? So 10 key points in, in about 45 minutes. Okay? That's, that's me talking for 45 minutes and you writing down 
10 or 12 words. All right, I'm sorry, I missed the connection. I remember you talking about both things, but I didn't put them together. So, Got it. Okay. So I make pictures, and then I only take notes when the trigger works to, to remind me of what they're saying. Yes. Okay. Yes. Got it. <laughs> yes. And, and here's the beauty of it. If you miss some of the detail-y stuff, if you look at your picture and it's, oh, wait a minute, what is that? Is there something missing there? You can easily go back to the source, to your friend, to somebody else, to Wikipedia or, or Google or someplace, and you can find the details if you miss them as long as you have the main idea written down. But if you miss the main idea, now what? You, 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 have, no, you have no reference to, to know where to begin looking. Does that make sense? Yeah.